El Reno, the darkest day in storm chasing history. It's a story we've all heard before. While widely regarded as a freak event, in reality, a similar situation happening again is not a matter of if, but when. Storm chasing is now more popular than ever, and with that, an increase of chasers getting hit by tornadoes and other close calls. Today, let's discuss the exact anatomy of the El Reno chasing tragedy to show how this scenario could easily unfold again. For the few that are unfamiliar, on May 31st, 2013, volatile atmospheric conditions supportive of strong tornadoes aligned in central Oklahoma. Chasers and members of the public alike headed for the obvious target, the small city of El Reno, just 20 miles west of Oklahoma City. Storms initiated in the late afternoon, and at 6.03 p.m. local time, a multiple vortex tornado touched down and began to carousel southeast. This defied expectations of the eastward moving storm, catching many chasers off guard. It would turn east while accelerating and growing in width. Those in its path fled for their lives as the chasers became the chased. It turned once again to the northeast, catching more chasers that were north of the tornado. Among those caught north were veteran and highly respected storm chasers Tim Samaris, son Paul, and Carl Young. A fourth chaser, Oklahoman native Richard Henderson, also lost his life in the northward turn. Several other chasers, including the Weather Channel's Tornado Hunt crew, were injured after being overtaken earlier in the tornado's life. This was a multifaceted tragedy. The pieces that fell into place for this to happen go beyond just the tornado itself, but it's the obvious place to start. To get a supercell thunderstorm to produce a significant tornado that has an erratic path, there are a few key atmospheric conditions. The combo of high instability and strong wind shear gave the parent storm a very wide updraft. Larger, more robust supercells are more apt to support the vast movement of air needed to spawn wide tornadoes, with El Reno being a record breaker at 2.6 miles. The wind shear also played a big role in what made this tornado behave erratically. Low-level winds were observed south-southeasterly at 10 to 15 miles per hour at the surface, while at one kilometer up, where the low-level jet resides, was due southerly at 40 miles per hour. The change in speed and direction over that lowest portion of the atmosphere alone supported tornadoes, but what made things particularly dangerous was how it related to the steering winds further up. These upper-level winds were steering this storm approximately east-northeast at 28 miles per hour. In cases where the low-level jet is stronger than the parent storm's motion, the tornado can become more susceptible to the dreaded left turn. This can be best thought of as a tug of war, where at first the parent storm motion is winning, but once the storm cycles a new updraft, that process separates the tornado from the main mesocyclone. Another famous example of the end-of-life left turn was the 2007 Greensburg EF5. Also present in the El Reno environment was a very saturated atmospheric profile, favoring a high precipitation storm mode. This would make spotting crucial storm features very difficult for chasers. In a world flooded with headlines and competing media, cutting through bias and sensationalism to find facts takes real effort. That's why I use Ground News, sponsor of today's video. They gather 50,000 news sources from all over the world and reveal the biases, factuality, and even ownership of the news sources. It gives quick and easy visual breakdowns of what's being reported by who, giving you multiple viewpoints to find the real facts. Let's take a look at the news story of the Enderlin tornado earning an EF5 rating. As you can see, this story was covered by over 200 news sources and the majority of them were in the center. I can also see that 98% of the sources have a high factuality rating. So that means I will be getting accurate information without any spin. What I really like is being able to compare the different headlines from each site. Like this coverage by Morning Call, which is left-leaning and has a very high factuality rating. Or this news source, Grand Forks Herald, that leans right and also has a high factuality rating. If you too want the best tool for keeping yourself properly informed, subscribe to Ground News to get 40% off the Vantage plan using my link, groundnews.com slash June 1st which you can find in the description, pinned comment, or you can scan this QR code. Thank you to Ground News for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back into it. The slower storm motions, strong low-level jet, and saturated profiles are not the full environmental picture. After all, the tornado's original path was southeast as opposed to the parent storm's east-northeast motion. What explains that? 
A view beyond our storm paints a better picture. Other cells can have a very strong influence over parent storms, which was the case in El Reno. Tornado Genesis was kicked off by strong downdrafts by other cells on the backside of the parent supercell. The overall environment supported strong downdrafts, and their surge to the southeast both ramped up storm relative inflow for tornado production and drove the initial tornado motion to the southeast. This combination of early, strong downdrafts and the late stage separation from the mesocyclone allowed the El Reno tornado to change speed and direction multiple times. The environment in storm itself is just the first piece of the greater puzzle. For storm chasers themselves, safe positioning and situational awareness around dangerous elements of the storm can keep them from costly mistakes. Deviant tornadoes were not as widely understood by chasers in 2013 the way they are now in 2025. However, left turns upon occlusion certainly were known then. Positions left of the mean motion were certainly dangerous. Positions left of the El Reno tornado were fatal. When and where the event took place also played a key role in the phenomenon known as chaser convergence. This occurs when a large number of storm chasers descend on a singular target area. This can often overwhelm rural road networks, causing chaser-induced traffic jams. What made convergence particularly bad on May 31, 2013 was the proximity to the Oklahoma City metro. While OKC is already the mecca of storm chasing, just 11 days prior, the suburb of Moore was completely devastated by an EF5 tornado. Tornadoes were fresh on the mind of those in OKC, and when the forecast showed another day of violent tornadoes for the region, many wanted to go try to see a tornado themselves. El Reno is only a 30-minute drive from downtown OKC, making it easy for anyone getting off work to go try to see a tornado for themselves. Combine this with May 31st being the middle of peak chasing season, so there's already a high number of chasers out on the road. By storm chasing standards, the road network near El Reno is very good. The mile-by-mile -mile grid of decent gravel roads is a luxury compared to other regions of chase country. However, they can still only take on so many vehicles. This complicated usual chaser traffic drastically, especially in a storm that was catching many of the experienced chasers off guard. Additionally, for those that haven't driven through a supercell, the conditions can be quite hazardous on their own. It can be a jarring experience for those that haven't driven in these conditions before, slowing traffic down for all on the road. In another final twist of misfortune, as the storm approached the western suburbs of Oklahoma City, a trusted local broadcast meteorologist stated if residents did not have a suitable shelter below ground, they should drive south out of the path of the storm. With the thought of the Moore EF5 still in mind for residents, thousands took to the streets to flee. To the south of the OKC Metro is the Canadian River, offering only a few river crossings. The ensuing traffic jam subjected thousands of motorists to the massive storm complex. Had another El Reno-type tornado formed over one of these traffic jams, it would have been a mass casualty event. So far, the key pieces learned from the El Reno event that led to a chaser tragedy were 1. An environment supported of A. Large HP supercells capable of producing B. Violent and erratic tornadoes 2. Dangerous positions around the storm and 3. An abundance of vehicles leading to chaser traffic. In 2025 and beyond, to get the alignment of these key pieces is not difficult, especially when storm chasing is more popular than ever. There used to be a concern chasing near metropolitan areas, but now, with storm chasing video games, content, and even storm chasing video game content, the popularity is at an all new level. This will continue to prompt more and more people to try storm chasing. Just in this past season, I myself witnessed some of the most intense chaser convergence I'd ever seen in my 10 years of chasing. A few times I was even stuck at a standstill with a tornado-worn supercell bearing down on me and the other chasers stuck on the road. While nothing bad happened, it was a wake-up call to me that we are the wrong event away from yet another chaser tragedy. Compounding on top of all of this is the inherent competition and striving for personal success. This happens in every hobby and profession, but this is a dangerous quality in the world of storm chasing. Balancing on the tightrope that is getting the best shot possible and staying safe can quickly get out of hand when the tornado has erratic behavior and is wider than it appears. A psychological phenomena that also occurs in chasing is mob mentality. Individuals in a group setting will adopt the behaviors different to their personal beliefs based on the actions of the greater group. 
I've seen convoys of chaser vehicles take an objectively poor route choice that would put them in a dangerous position. For new chasers that may not fully be aware of the situation, they can easily default to mob mentality and start following other vehicles thinking that they know what's best. All it takes is one or two cars to make the wrong move that could end in complete disaster. This entire video is to say that while El Reno is currently the only tornado to have claimed storm chasers' lives, the conditions for that type of incident from happening again are not rare and are likely increasing with storm chasing's continued increase in popularity. This is not to dissuade people from trying or learning storm chasing, but rather a message of caution. If it's your first time, find someone that knows what they're doing to bring you along. Study as much as you can about storm structure, positionings, and safe practices. It is incredible to witness the power of the sky but it is never worth risking your life recklessly. Folks, and as always, stay safe out there when it comes to severe weather.